At that time, Jesus revealed himself to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. He revealed himself in this way. Together with Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan, Galilee, Zebedee's sons, and two other disciples of his. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we also will come with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. When it was already dawn, Jesus was standing on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you caught nothing to eat? They answered, no. So he said, cast the net over the right side of the boat and you will find something. So they cast it and they were not able to pull it in because of the number of fish. So the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he tucked in his garment for he was lightly clad and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat for they were not far from the shore, only about 200 yards, only about a hundred yards, dragging the net with the fish. When they climbed out on shore, they saw a charcoal fire with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore, filled with 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? But they realized it was the Lord. Jesus came over and took the bread and gave it to them, and in a like manner, the fish. It was now the third time Jesus was revealed to his disciples after being raised from the dead. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. Lord, is it really you? Throw your net over the side. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been out fishing all night and the mosquitoes go to dinner on you and you smell like oil and you smell like off and you smell like, and you're tired and you're hungry? And then you got bait all over your hands and you don't want to touch any other part of your body. And daylight comes up. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> throw your nets in one more time. You throw them in and jump in after them. I ain't want. That whole idea. And it's what we read in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, unless the Lord build a, a house then in vain do the builders labor. Anything that we do on our own usually doesn't fall real well. You know, people have all these plans. I love these people who've got the, their lives planned. It's in their daily planner. You know, after all, it's supposed to happen because it's part of my five-year plan. <laughs> the ability to allow God to lead us where he wants us to be. That's very, very difficult. You know, the whole idea of, uh, of a calling is, is not to say, what do you want to do in life? The whole idea of a calling is to allow God to call us to where he wants us to be. One of the things that was very, very important in, in vocation work and I still believe it. You know, when I was growing up, we had these morning offerings that we put on our, our mirrors that we would say while we were brushing our teeth, getting ready to go to Catholic school. I don't know what kind of glue that they put on those stupid things. You can't get them off. They're still on there, you know, 60 years later. But anyway, it was a little morning offer. We offer up our prayers, our works, everything to you, O oh Lord. And, but it was an idea that this day was for God and we were getting to enjoy it. And when I was vocation director, I used to pass out a little prayer for all the kids. Lord, let me know what you want me to be and what you want me to do today. That was a prayer. Lord, 
let me know what you want me to be and what you want me to do today. And the idea of that was very simply that we're here to say yes to what God wants for us. That's why we're here. And if I start in first grade, if I start in fifth grade, sixth grade, and all that time, every day I think, Lord, let me know what you want me to be and do this day. If I live my life thinking that I've got another day to do what God wants of me, then there's going to come a time when I'm going to really know. But if I wait till I'm 17 and I'm full of hormones and glands and everything else, and I decide I'm going to try and figure out what I want, those things get pretty messy sometimes. And think about it. Those of you who are parents, who are raising children, and you got a 15-year-old, 16-year-old, well, it's time to talk about college, it's time to talk about this, it's time to talk about that. How many people have had your child walk up to you and say, Mom, Dad, I want to go to college and I think I want to study philosophy. I think I want to study history, you know. I think I want to study English literature. How much philosophy and English literature can you eat? What are you going to college for? You got to get out of school one day and make a living. You can't eat philosophy and English literature. You got to get a job. Mom, Dad, I think I'm in love. I want to get married. Well, you know, we don't know if they're in love or in there in heat. They can't keep their hands off each other all weekend, okay? But they're coming in and they want to get married and we're all excited. How many have ever said, do you really think this is a person God wants you to spend the rest of your life with? Oh, it's, oh you, you want to get married? <laughs> well, great, he's going to be a doctor or a lawyer, isn't he? Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you're going to, you know, you can have a mother-in-law apartment there in the, in the new house. I mean, how many of us ask the question? We look at opportunities. Our kids decide to study what they can make the most money off of. That's what we want of them. We want them to be a success. Oh, God, I hadn't seen you in so long. How are the kids? How are they doing? Oh, they're wonderful. This one just got into med school, and this one just got a home in a gated community and put their kids in a Catholic school. You know, and this one just landed a supervisor's job and they're moving to California and the company's moving them and they're paying the car and they're doing all, and they're doubling their salary. I didn't ask you how much money they make. What kind of people are they? You, you ever do that? We think someone's successful. They got a ton of money. They live in a certain neighborhood. They drive a certain car. Does that make somebody successful? Does that make someone a good person? Does that make someone happy? Does that make someone pleasing in the sight of God? That's the question. We don't start it when they're 17 years old. We start it from day one, starting to believe that God has something He wants me to do. And in doing that, if I find what it is God wants me to do, I'm going to have all the happiness I ever thought of and more. Trust me. Trust me. When we get to that point where we're able to discover in our life, you know, my skin fits good. I'm where I should be. I'm living the way I should be. I'm doing the things that I should do. No, I'm not perfect. I have a long way to go in holiness. But I'm on the right road. I'm, I'm in the right place. You know, and... I believe it with all my heart. God wants me to love this person and live with them and take care of them in their old age. God wants me to bring these children into the world and give them purpose and meaning. God wants me to have this occupation so that I can help people who are less fortunate and in need and don't have one, anyone who can do that for them. God wants me to do it because he, need, he needs someone to serve in his church. You know, we, we talk a lot these days about the, the, the vocation crisis. There's not a crisis in vocation. There's a crisis of people who look to God for their direction in life. There's our crisis. 
not priests, nuns, brothers, deacons, is a crisis of people who look to God for their direction in life. What if every young person who got married approached marriage from the standpoint of view that this is a person God had chosen me for, chosen for me, and really believed it and prayed together? We don't have all the, the broken family problems. We don't have all that. Not if people enter into marriage thinking that this is who God wants of me. God, are they hot? Would you look at that? So why you marry somebody? So why you marry somebody? That gets old real quick. Oh man, they're gonna make a ton of money. So why you marry somebody? You don't sleep in their bank vault, you sleep with them. And you gotta live with them. And you gotta live with their, their values, their priorities, their everything. The understanding is, is that Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to be today? Begin that very early on. And if we hadn't started it, start it. Start it. Do you really think God wants you to sit around in your bathrobe and watch soap operas all day long? You're fine, you're healthy, you, you've got ability, you've got means. You really think God wants you to sit there and watch daytime dramas? I'm sorry, I shouldn't have called them soap operas. But anyway, do you really believe that's what, why God put us here? Do you really believe that all the situations that we look at, we say, isn't that terrible? I, I, I really, no, but I, I should, but no. I, you really think God wants to ignore that? Lord, what do you want me to be? What do you want me to do today? You start asking that question throughout, throughout the day. You see a situation, say, Lord, what do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? You'd be surprised. You have a hard time sleeping tonight when you drive away from something that God gave you the answer you weren't looking for. That understanding is what Peter and James and the Canaanite, that's what they were, that's what they were, were realizing. That by the power of God, we do things we never knew possible. And but we've got to want that in our lives. Lord, what do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? How do you want me to live? How do you want me to treat this situation? How do you want me to help this child with a problem? How do you want me to help that aging parent? How do you want me to deal with the fact that, that, that they, they're not all together there and they've changed their personality, they've gotten very angry and they're hard to deal with and I love them but I feel so guilty because I don't want to be around them because they make me so mad. All that stuff. Lord, help me here. Lord, bring me to where I need to be. What do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? You want me to walk away? You want me to fuss back? You want me to be impatient with them? You want me to yell at them? Bless their hearts. They don't know what they're doing. What do you want me to be? What do you want me to do? It's simple. It's simple. You know, the kids used to wear this, these little braces, WWJD. What would Jesus do? I think they just liked the color. They ignored the message. If, if everyone did that, what would Jesus have me do in this situation? How would Jesus have me treat these people? How would Jesus make me react in this situation? Start asking. And, but if you ask, you better be ready for your answer. That's the difficult part. That's what we're going to talk about when we come back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Closer Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today. And a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey's over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support enables us to do that. So we thank you and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you.
Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you just caught. So Simon Peter went over and dragged the net ashore full of 153 large fish. Even though there were so many, the net was not torn. Hello and welcome back to Close to Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad that you can join us. I don't know why they tell us there are 153 uh, fish in there, but I think they just caught a whole mess of fish would have been good enough, but there are a few of these details that are important. And one is, is it's to talk about how the Lord increases our portion when we allow ourselves to do the will of God. How the Lord increases our, our portion when we just say, you know, Lord, I'm showing up. And we end up doing things that we never, ever thought humanly possible. The girl that I grew up with dated my brother. The debutante, the beauty queen, da 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 all that stuff. Had great plans. A lot of them fell apart, including the marriage. Found herself in some country in Africa, digging wells and living with the native people, and just fell in love. Can't wait to get back probably spend six months out of the year in the darkest Africa. I think it's Cameroon is, is a country. And here she is, you know, the beauty queen who probably doesn't bathe for a couple weeks while she's there. Never knew she could be so happy. Never knew she could have such a profound effect on people's lives. Never knew that she could make such a difference. And she's not over there teaching them how to do their hair and makeup. She's over there bringing them a gospel. She's over there bringing them hope. And for the first time, I think she's really happy. I think she's really happy. And, you know, in, in the years when I was going every year to Calcutta, I had a waiting list of people who wanted to go. And, and, and that always kind of amazed me you know, why people wanted to go, you know, and uh, part of it was fascination. Part of it was wanting to be altruistic. Part of it was wanting to say I work with Mother Teresa in Calcutta. Part of it was all of that. Uh, they got to Calcutta and the only thing that really changed in Calcutta was themselves. And that was a really cool thing. I had some rather famous people go with me one time and they had a lot of money and everything and they thought they're going to go there and have this great project and they'd be able to change something. They didn't change anything and unfortunately didn't change them because they thought they were going to find a way they could start a business, and not to make money, but to help people go there and see what God has in store for you. There have been a number of times in my ignorance uh, that, that God has taught me a whole lot. I went to Medjugorje for the first time because all this stuff, gold rosaries and all that stuff, I was going to check it out. Uh, yeah, yeah, the gold rosary stuff happened. You know what I understood, what, what, what God changed about me? He changed me as a confessor. When I sat in these fields for six, eight hours at a time and having people come and just, you know, in, in the parish you get a lot of people who want to go back to communion. In the fields out there I got a lot of people who want to go back to God. And there was a big difference. And I was on my little fact-finding mission about whether or not she was really there. God changed me. Yeah, I've got some ideas about, 
you know, the apparitions in Medjugorje, but that's secondary. The good thing was God changed me. You know, when I went to Calcutta for the very first time, the reason why I suspected people's intentions, because I knew what mine was, you know, I get to go to Calcutta and see Mother Teresa, all that stuff. Uh, I wasn't expecting what I got. Uh, yeah, you know, I've, I, I bathed people who were, you know, dying, and we picked them up in the streets, and we, you know, I played with kids who were all deformed because of botched abortions, and you know, did, did all that. But uh, I don't, I don't know that that, that the people change me, but the stuff changed me. The one who changed me was the, the, the guy who worked the night guard at, at the rectory. And we, I got to be friends with Anthony, and finally he took me home. And, and he had a room, maybe 10 by 10, uh, with a mattress on the floor, and a couple flat pans and some cow pies, yeah. You country people, that's what I'm talking about, you know. The cow chip, that's what I'm talking about. And in that room, his wife, his mother, his two children and himself lived. And he was so very grateful that when it rained, his children didn't get wet. And God had been so good to him because his children got to stay dry when it rained. And then I come back to a parish and the ladies all to, all to society has a big to do about whether or not we serve in ham or turkey at the Thanksgiving social. I've changed, baby. I've changed, you know, and uh, uh, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm going. I'm working in the home from die. I'm working in the children's home. I'm doing all the, 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 these different things, but I understood what Mother Teresa said. You know, it's not what you have. It's what has you. And you start to understand. Do I have a nice car? Yeah, I got a 2014 Impala. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's okay. It's a nice car. Uh, but the car, you know, I've wrecked it twice, but anyway. You know, that isn't the important thing. You know, it's that it's comfortable, but it's not that important. It's not that important. And that is the invitation that when our Lord, when Peter comes and says, there were 153 fish. Yeah, that's like three days work for you, okay? That's a lot more money you ever had. What God changes, he changes your, your, your portion. We go into situations and when we say, okay, God, I'm here. God changes us, but it may not be what we're looking to change. We may go in and say, yeah, I need to start this, I need to stop that, and I, I need to be better at this, I need to be better in that. And we find ourselves miles away from where we started. Lord, there ain't no fish here. But if you say so. Lord, I just need to be there and show up. And I need to allow you, God, to change the situation and change the circumstances and change me in my life. Uh, one uh, uh, another situation, you know that, and, and I've worked in seven different prisons. The last particular place where I was, it was really incredible. Uh, I looked at it and said, "Oh gosh, if I had to wake up to this every day, if I had to go through this every day, if I had to wait every, this long to get through a gate every day." And I saw so many people with so much hope. I saw so many, so many people with so much faith. I saw so many people who really were looking to do something good in the middle of a situation that I considered very, very tough, very, very difficult. I went there maybe thinking I, I, I could help the inmates. These guys changed me. You know, they changed me. They didn't change my driving that much, but they changed everything else, okay? I mean. They, 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 they made me understand that, you know, that you, you, you have to deal with, play the cards you've been given. And that's what you learn to play. 
And you don't sit around and complain about you didn't get the right hand, you didn't get the right cards, you didn't get the right options, you didn't get the right opportunities, you didn't get the right family. This is what you got. This is what you deal with. And this is how God changes our lives. And the story of Peter, you know, of not wanting it, but showing up anyway. And sometimes we go dragging and kicking and screaming and God shows us something that that's why we're there. And it's happened so many times. I go back to where we started. Lord, let me know what you want me to be. Lord, let me know what you want me to do today. You realize how important that little statement can be if we pray it earnestly? We don't need those morning offerings that you can't get off your mirror. We just need that, 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 let me know what you want me to be. Let me know what you want me to do. What am I supposed to be with this person who just walked in my business and is acting like that? What am I supposed to do when I see a person like that and I'm in a hurry and I've got to be there and I've got to be there? Lord, why am I going into this situation? I went in there thinking I was supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And guess what, Lord? I didn't do any of them. And you showed me what I needed to learn. I thought I was going to change them. They ended up changing me. That's the spirit. That's the spirit that changes the world. We just need enough people who are serious about that. They're serious about being and becoming what God wants them to be. That's not in their day planner. That's not in their five or their 10 or their 20 year program. It's where I am, it's what I am, and it's what God is asking of me today. And if we ever get to that point, and people who suffer from addiction and in 12 step recovery, they do that. See these bumper stickers one day at a time? I gotta be sober today. I gotta be clean today. I gotta take care of my business today. If we do that with God, you'd be amazed how much we become, what God wants us to be, and how insignificant our day planner becomes. We thank you for being with us. May each day bring you close in your walk with the Lord. God bless you. Thank you.